From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Welcome to Monday's programme. It's a glorious afternoon in Salford and around Greater Manchester generally. Hope you've had a really good weekend and you're rested and raring to go. I've got a top show for you this Monday. I'll tell you about my guest in a moment or two. You can't tweet the programme, sadly, because the programme is suspended, I don't know, temporarily, maybe permanently from Twitter. So I don't know how we're going to get your comments. We'll work something out during the week as we go along. Anywho. Yes? Yeah, okay. We'll crack on with it then. I do, uh, by the way, uh, share around your own social media pages, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, about our guest uh, today and our guests every day. Every little help. Every little helps, you know, I suppose. (laughs) Right. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show. It is live and uh, not so interactive today, but there you go. Nice to be with you. To be with you. Nice. Let's do it then. Let's crack right on. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Now, my guest today is an author, a broadcaster, a politician, and the man who invented the email. Yes, he's got multiple degrees and PhDs, including a PhD in biological engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's very, very well known indeed. It's Dr. Shiva Ayadure. Dr. Shiva Ayadure. He joins the program in around about 25 minutes' time to tell me and you why he disagrees with his own government's response, not only his own government, but governments around the world and the way they have responded to coronavirus. Lots to get into with the Dr. Shiva Ayadure. He joins the program in about 25 minutes. There you are. And that's Monday's program. We're going to round the news up into the news, eh? Eh? <laughs> the news. Nothing but coronavirus. It's a it's a thing of beauty, really. The, the the programming that's going on, the mind control. I don't use words and phrases like mind control lightly. I don't throw them around willy nilly. But it's what's going on. It's quite startling, really. You know, part of what I do is to spend quite a bit of time watching. And listening to the TV and radio. And like, like I said last week, I'm only repeating myself. Mouth ajar. Mouth gaping open. Not believing what I'm seeing. It's vaudeville. It really is. If you don't know what I mean by that, well, look it up. I mean, it's it's crazy stuff, right? Right. Right, I've asked you, are you well? We've established that you are because you're here. Did you flout the lockdown? Did you yesterday? Did you defy the lockdown around the world? Great weather in most places in the UK yesterday. We went out with our dogs, the park in morning and the football in afternoon and played with our dogs, met some people, chatted while the dogs played. It's what we would do anyway. Uh, The early walk was busy, met lots of people, kind of quite around in the afternoon. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in good spirits apparently in hospital. He's got a temperature apparently. You might know this, Boris Johnson has been in isolation for more than a week and his temperature temporarily spiked, I believe, and rather than take any precaution, they whisked him into hospital, into an hospital, as we would say in God's country. So he's in there, annoying the bejesus, presumably, out of the staff. Interesting story about the police doing the rounds of the UK news websites this afternoon, A man was fined after driving at 110 miles per hour on the motorway. When he was pulled over, he said to the police he'd been on he'd been on his way back from London to buy bread. He was on his way to Nottingham. He was on his way to Nottingham. Police pulled him over. Where were you? I was in London. Why? Well, I was buying bread there. Travelling at 110 miles an hour with two children in the car. Why were you going to London for bread? He said the bread was a pound cheaper in London. Oh, God. Leicestershire police said he was handed two fixed penalty notices and reported to court for the speeding. Court will decide what punishment to give him. Driving at 110 miles an hour on a motorway with children in the car. 
Uh, ban him for three years. Rip his licence up. No driving for you for three years, pal. Closing parks and open spaces in the UK should be a last resort. Says who? Says the community secretary. He's a guy called Robert Jenrick. And he told BBC Radio 4's Today programme, local councils should be very judicious in taking the step to close a park. He went on to implore people to bloody well stay inside. Stay inside, can't you? Why were they talking about this today? Well, Lambeth Council closed Brockwell Park yesterday afternoon because there were so many people there, you see. Now, they reopened it this morning, but they closed it yesterday afternoon because the weather was gorgeous and people went out and about. Jenrick said, I have a lot of sympathy, he said, with those concerned that public confidence could be lost by people in power closing parks. So here's the Mayor of London, Labour's Sadiq Khan. He's the Mayor, don't you know? And he's on Sky News today and here he is speaking about the decision or not to close the parks. We've got more than 9 million people living in our city and the vast, vast majority are following the rules. There is a small minority that aren't following the rules, that are in close proximity, that are doing things they shouldn't really do during a global pandemic. Now, the problem and the challenge for that council is uh, they saw on Saturday very large numbers uh, not following the uh, rules, and they were worried about that accelerating the spread of the virus. So in consultation with the local police, they made a decision, a tough decision, to close the park on Sunday. It's reopened uh, today. The key thing is for all of us to please follow the rules. Uh, You're right, there are many Londoners who haven't got the luxury of a garden or a bigger home. Often they have young children, uh, and they need to get out and use these green public spaces. And that's why it's really important we continue to abide by the rules. What nobody wants is a park like Brockwell Park having to be closed on a Sunday. And that's why it's really important that the small minority that aren't following the rules, please follow the rules. It's so important. Follow the rules. Why can't you just follow the rules? You bastards. I didn't mention, he's Labour's Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. I didn't mention yesterday, maybe I did mention it, Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson are back running Labour now. Although they never left, did they really? Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, if you please, is the new leader of the Labour Party. I think he got 52% of the votes, did he? Or 56? Might have been 56. And he appointed a shadow cabinet of Blairites. Blairites. Ed Miliband joined today. Do you remember Ed Miliband? The man who screwed up eating an egg? It didn't cost him the election a few years back, but well... Uh, he's the shadow business secretary now. What happened to, oh, Jeremy Corbyn? Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. What happened to all of that, eh? I warned you, but you wouldn't listen. Blair Wright's back in charge of Labour now. Let's leave that. I mentioned Vaudeville a minute ago. Now, my great friend, the great thespian, the great thespian herself, Jean Anne, oft mentioned, and deservedly so mentioned. Great thespian, great achievements on stage and screen. She will know what Vaudeville it, the reference to vaudeville is vaudeville is even <laughs> you might think I don't know I do yeah, again I, I mentioned watching and listening and watching and listening I'm in the park I'm on I'm on park you don't go into the park if you're from Salford you go on to the park I don't know how it works so I was on park earlier today and listened to the radio as I do and I was stunned because BBC Radio 4's Today programme is a bit of a national institution. It's a news programme. You get nothing on it but a dry read-through of the news and some interviews that in the past were good. Hostile interviews with presenters who know how to screw a politician to the wall, nail him to the wall. It's a very important programme, very dry. Well, I was listening to the uh, show today and I couldn't believe my ears. Because the Radio 4 Today show is now running, (laughs) is now running, because of the times we are in, it's running a new Comfort and Hope segment, Amy. What kind of fuckery is this? Yeah. It's got a new Comfort and Hope segment where famous people, BBC people, including BBC journalists, will read poems and tell stories. I am not lying. This morning, the Europe editor for the BBC, a woman called Katja Adler, and her daughter, Sophia, read The Stolen Orange by Brian Patton. 
Now that's a poem, by the way. And it reminds Katya of her late dad and of the simple things we can find around us to give us comfort in these dark times. Vaudeville has come to BBC Radio 4's Today programme. To Stolen Orange by Brian Patton. (laughs) I'm reading this with my daughter Sophia because she's about the same age that I was when I first discovered this poem, fell in love with it and got courage from it. When I left, I stole an orange. I kept it in my pocket. It felt like a warm planet. Everywhere I went smelt of oranges. Whenever I got into an awkward situation, I'd take out the orange and smell it. And immediately, on even dead branches, (laughs) I saw the lovely and fierce orange blossom that smells so much of joy. When I went out, I stole an orange. Stole an orange. It was a safeguard against imagining. There was nothing bright or special in the world. Ah. Hey, Tom, did you hear this? Did you hear this, Tom? BBC reporters and Europe editors are now reading out poems on the Today programme for our comfort and our hope. Did you hear that, Tom? No. Could you repeat it? Because I I can't believe my fucking ears. Neither can I, Tom. Neither can I. It's 14 minutes past five. It is a glorious afternoon here in Salford. It really is. MPs are calling for an investigation into false narratives. This is the UK's Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee. Now the chair of that is Julian Knight, MP. And he's fed up about all of the false narratives around coronavirus. (laughs) And they have to be dealt with. People like, well, people who present independent media radio programmes whom give a platform sometimes to those who have a different opinion or who have a different take on what's happening. We might be disseminating false narratives and we need to be dealt with. This is true. Julian Knight said this today. We know where this is going. This isn't new. We've seen this coming. No need for me to dwell on this. So there isn't. Disinformation, he said, disinformation. Now, it's funny that the BBC reported that. The BBC today were reporting on the need to deal with the disinformation. Every BBC news programme this afternoon said that there's so much misleading stuff online about coronavirus. Well, these people need to be dealt with. They need to be dealt with. I thought it was ironic that today the BBC were going so far down the road of attacking the independent media. Today, particularly that you had Katya Adler reading a poem on the Today Show, but it got even worse because this morning on BBC Radio 5 Live, the presenters got caught with their trousers dune. They got caught with their pants dune. You see, there's a GP called Ellie Cannon, a doctor. Oh, she's an awful pain in the arse now, believe me. She's on the BBC and Sky all the time. Makes you wonder why she's on the BBC and Sky all the time. One, because there are other doctors. And two, because she isn't very good on air. Not great, not got much presence about her, I wouldn't have said. Then again, what do I know, right? So BBC Radio 5 Live this morning had her on to take calls from people, people at home, medical calls. So you might ring up. Live, BBC Radio 5 Live this morning to speak to Dr Ellie to say, Ellie, I, I have a little tickle in my tonsils or I have a little ticker on my todger or whatever, right? And she would give you an answer. Dave called up. Dave asked his question about his health. You will hear the tail end of the answer given to Dave and then Dave throws in a quick question before they let him go. And it's quite wonderful, really. If I can play it now, because for some bloody reason, things are gone a bit mad here at Richie Allen Show Towers. Yes, here we go. Dave calls in, has a health problem. She gives him an answer. You will hear the tail end of the answer. And then he throws in an extra question. And it's just glorious. The fact that you feel well to go back tells us that you're not still sneezing. You're not still coughing. Your amount of virus in your body is going to be negligible, if any at all. And therefore, your chance of passing it on to anybody are going to be even smaller than that. So I would feel reassured that from what you've said, you are fine to go back to work. She'd put the most hyperactive child in the world to sleep, wouldn't she? That's what I meant by having very little presence. So she's answered Dave's question. You'll be able to go back to work, Dave. And then Dave throws this in. Great stuff. Well, hopefully. Fingers crossed. 
Good um, luck, Dave. R- Rachel, yeah. Chris, very quickly, can you just at some point raise this subject to the volunteer army? Um, because this was obviously trumpeted by the government two or three weeks ago, but we've got 750,000. And uh, if you look on social media, they've all sent the forms off, and I don't think anyone has actually heard anything since. Isn't that amazing? Will you look into the volunteer army, Rachel? And Chris on BBC Radio 5 Live, because you talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, and all the pathos that went with it. You told us how great a country we were, that the the NHS needed half a million volunteers, they needed them, and you'd never shut up about it, BBC 5 Live Breakfast, and you told us we should all get involved, and yet nothing is happening. It's just not happening. There are social media pages all over the place where people are saying, nobody's gotten back to me. Is this, is this NHS army? Is it a load of bollocks or what? And the presenters, you can hear there's a little bit of an edge in their voice because they've been caught with their trues or stoon. Um, it seems to have sort of withered on the well, vine. The, the ro- withered on the vine and listen to the response. The Thank Royal you. Voluntary Service, I think, is coordinating all... Very edgy, she sounds. ...those applications and probably furiously going through them and, and trying to allocate them to appropriate roles. But it's worth us checking out and, yeah, and catching yeah. up on that one, Dave. Thank you for that. It's a good reminder. Lots of um, work I out I, there, I, Yeah, there, I, don't, I don't think it's gone away at all. I think it's just a massive logis- logistical yeah. operation. Far thanks more to than Dave and Chester. Expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's get yeah, yeah, let's move on very quickly, Dave. We're the, we're the national breakfast breakfast show, news breakfast show on BBC Radio 5 Live. We went on and on about this thing. You all signed up to it and then we just dropped it because it's bullshit is what it is. And you've caught us with our trousers down. There is no volunteer army. It's a nonsense. Ah, 19 and a half, 20 minutes of this past the hour. Let's move on before I lose my mind. Love that, yeah. Love when they get caught. Tobias Elwood is a Tory MP. He chairs the Defence Select Committee. That's a prestigious gig. And he was on Sky News Breakfast with Kay Burley, the ginger ninja. And Kay asks him, is there an exit strategy from lockdown? Right? Kay asks him, was an exit strategy outlined in government on the day they announced the lockdown? That's a good question from Kay Burley. A, is there an exit strategy? And B, was there one from the get-go? Needless to say... The chair of the Defence Select Committee doesn't properly answer it. Well, um, as the doctor, Dr Lloyd, just said, we're still learning an awful lot uh, about the coronavirus and we have to adapt quickly. But you're absolutely right. Uh, It's almost like waiting for a train on the station. If you're not aware of why there is delay, you get even more frustrated. So the government must uh, take the nation uh, with it, must uh, understand the phases that we're going through, the responsibilities that all of us must, must participate in that but also that there is a plan that there is a a vision of where we're going to go something for us to look forward to we must all buy into that it could very well be that the hardship that we endure post the coronavirus in this initial stage is going to be tougher than the virus itself you need to educate the nation to anticipate and expect that and indeed prepare and work with it and support it Things are going to be dreadful in the wake of the virus. Is what Tobias Elwood said at the end, which is why I grabbed the audio, even though he didn't answer Burley's question. It's going to be bloody horrendous. Then Kay brings up China. Strangely enough. Kay wanted to talk about the consequences for China when this is all over. Uh, Now's not the time. Now's not the time, but I'm going to say it anyway. But I'm guessing in the fullness of time, eyes will cast to the east... Eyes will cast to the east. You won't be able to help it, dear listener. You won't know why. All of a sudden, you'll find yourself looking to the east to blame the Chinese. I wonder about China's involvement in what's happened to paralyse the world. Those monkey eaten. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, there are major questions, frustrations that the Chinese sat on this for four weeks. I'm afraid they have form here. When the SARS virus came out, they didn't inform the World Health Organization for 88 days. Now imagine if we had four extra weeks to put things into place. Of course, there'll be questions about our own uh, conduct, the decisions that we're making here. But ultimately, the entire globe is affected by this. There will be a global recession. There needs to be some form of domestic martial plan, in my view. There also needs to be some form of global recovery roadmap uh, as well. And don't forget that whilst all this is happening, we have state and non-state adversaries uh, that wish us harm. We should anticipate and expect cyber attacks Uh, disinformation uh, and other challenges to our way of life uh, and the standards and values that we uphold. It's going to be a tough uh, few years ahead, 
Uh, but going back... Tough few years ahead, eh? Back to your point. We need... The- Debenhams has gone to the wall here in the UK. Companies are dropping like flies all over the place. The construction sector is absolutely banjaxed. The recession that's coming in the next few months, in the next few years, will make the the wake of the manufactured 2008 crash look like Disneyland. I've been saying this now since I came back. It's going to be horrifying for people. And those of you who've been with me for years, and I've heard some of the learned men and women, some still here, some gone, Jim Mars, rest in peace. This is the way it's going to be, because it's the way it was meant to be. Yeah. We need the nation uh, behind the government and the gov- we need the nation behind the government. government needs- Take all the austerity we have lined up for you. The government needs to rally for that support. I wanted to ask you, that's where I was leading to, about nations that would wish us harm. Nations that would wish us harm. Now she's going to talk. You see how none of this is, is spontaneous. Kay Barley doesn't have a spontaneous bone in her body. She's now going to raise the spectre that the UK is a bit vulnerable now to attacks from her enemies because the UK is dealing with the coronavirus. So she's basically given an opening to Tobias Elwood, the chair of the Defence Select Committee, to say that we need to spend more money on the military. This isn't spontaneous. You can hear, by the way, Barley even phrases her question that it is a question she has been fed. I'm tired of explaining this stuff to you. Listen to what she says. How do, can we still protect it ourselves uh, effectively in these uh, challenging times? When wow. Literally the country's on its knees. Country's on its knees. How's the military? Sneeze. But the answer is we need more money. Well, I've been pushing, I've been pushing for an increase in the uh, uh, defence budget for some time now. <laughs> uh, huge praise to our armed forces, which are doing such a fantastic... Yeah, don't spend money on schools, on hospitals, on playing fields. Don't build houses for people, affordable houses. Don't do that. Don't build love. Don't build happiness. Don't build beauty and a great society. No, no, just build more guns and bombs and weapons of mass destruction, evil things. That's what we need to do, Kay. Fantastic job um, with the uh, the NHS and so forth. But ultimately, they need, they have a day job. They need to watch our backs. And I hope that the review that will eventually take place will recognise uh, that the challenges that we face are growing and they're getting more complex, more complicated. They're moving into the sphere of space as well as the cyber as well we do need to invest more in our armed forces yes let's invest more in our armed forces says Tobias Elwood the chair of the defense select committee these people are sick aren't they but anyway look it's 26 minutes past the hour we are excited I know you're I'm excited you must be excited the doctor Shiva Ayadure will join the program live in about five minutes time I was really happy he got back to me very quick today he's doing a lot of media He's a a dissenting voice, you see. He's a very qualified man, very qualified man. And he's been critical now for some time of his own government's response to coronavirus. He's also been hugely critical, as I said earlier, of the global response. Uh, We're going to talk about Anthony Fauci, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who basically tells Trump what to think and what to say about the uh, response to coronavirus. We're also going to talk about vaccines, obviously. We're going to talk about the impact globally on the economy. We'll talk about all of that and I'm looking forward to it. So before we do that then, let's take a tune. I've got Simon and Garfunkel lined up. Sure, why not? It's a sunny Monday afternoon. The Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Back in three. 